and good evening to all. Welcome to uh, what I can, I can, uh, I, uh, I'm about to introduce a gentleman who doesn't believe in predictions, but I can predict with certainty that you're going to enjoy the next hour or so. Uh, I know this uh, not only from my own experiences of having talked with this gentleman many times, but also from the fact that uh, just over a year ago, I had the great pleasure of interviewing him right here in this room, and I see many faces of people who were here uh, back back then, and it was so much fun, and there were so many stories and ideas left untold that right there we, uh, we agreed that we would do this again. So this is actually part two. I should also mention that this evening is being done in conjunction with JREF, the James Randi Educational Foundation, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that is. Uh, but I will also tell you that uh, through the, uh, the hard work of John Armstrong, and DJ Grothy, DJ is the president of JREF, and John, of course, is on the board of trustees and runs a lot of stuff. Uh, and between the two of them, it is being worked on that this will be a series and that we will have more of these uh, long-term interviews, long-form interviews, involving people who intersect these two related worlds of uh, the skeptical world, the paranormal world, the magician's world, and sort of everything in between. So uh, no better way to get that started than for me to reintroduce for part two of our conversation, the gentleman of the evening, please welcome the amazing James Randi. Well, thank you, Matt. Thank you so much. Oh. They liked you. <laughs> well, no, they just applaud. You see, they do that automatic. It's a reaction. It's built into the DNA. It's a long story. I don't want to get into it. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's move from that long story to a short story because I have been informed that you have a topical tale you'd like to tell. Yes, uh, I, uh, I, I'm sure. First of all, I've got to say that I am very honored to have been asked back here. Uh, the first one was pretty good. I don't know what I'm going to say this time, but uh, I hope it's just as good. Or I um, welcome, welcome you folks back to the castle again. Many of you have probably not been here since the fire. And uh, I'm amazed at the improvement of the close-up room, for one thing. Have you seen that? And in the dining room. I really like the changes that are made in the dining room. It's, I'm so happy to be here at the castle, which is still with us, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. Yeah. as I am. So there. <laughs> uh, but I, I am reminded, <clears throat> I'm reminded of the story of the two gentlemen at Miami Beach who are in adjacent deck chairs. Now, you see, I saw the improvements, the beautiful rug upstairs and stuff like that. It turns out that the castle, luckily, was heavily covered in, insur in insurance, and that did the job. And I'm very happy to, uh, to assure you that if you should light another fire, it'll be taken care of, just in case. But the two gentlemen at the, at the beach in Miami, side by side in deck chairs, one looks over and to the other one, he says, uh, how do you do, sir? My name is Feynman. Uh, I, I came here under strange circumstances. The other fellow says, uh, what circumstances? He says, well, he said, you know, I was in the tex textile business and we had a fire. It was a terrible fire. And then when the insurance agent came to me, I realized I was really well covered in insurance. I made so much that at this early age, I've retired. And that's what brings me to Miami Beach. How come you're here? He says, well, that's a very similar story. <laughs> very similar story. I was in the hardware business, and we had a flood, a terrible flood. Oh, you had no idea. It was just, and that brought me here. The other fellow looks at him puzzled. He said, a flood? He says, yeah, a flood. How do you set a flood? <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. Think about it. <laughs> no, uh, no, I'm, I'm very, very um, happy to announce to you that uh, the, the castle has recovered beautifully, as you can see, and the shows are back in full swing. There's still a few adjustments and things to be done, but they're being done, and our castle is back in business. Yay! You bet. Stay out here with us. <laughs> uh, I'll try. I'm leaving tomorrow morning, but I'll, I'll, I'll be here for a <laughs> 
So have you seen any good magic here? Have I seen any good magic here? Such a question. I tell you, the, the other night, well, I've been here three or four nights now in a row, and uh, I must say that the show I saw a couple of nights ago, I went around, I, I took in every possible show, one after the other, bang, 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 like that. And um, <clears throat> that was simply the best night I had ever spent at the Magic Castle. And I've spent a lot of, of nights here, full evenings, and that one was, that all of the shows were simply superb. I was stunned by it. And if you haven't seen the shows yet, folks, you've got a great treat ahead of you. Well, the, the last time we spoke at one of these, uh, we talked a bit about some of the magicians you, you admired in your youth. And uh, that would include Harry Blackstone Sr. was one of the people we talked about, mm -hmm. and several others. Uh, do you feel that there is a significant difference between the magic that was going on when, when you were coming up as a teenager and, and what's going on in magic now? And, and I'll ask you this both plus and minus. Well, um, I, I must say that the, the one thing I've observed in, the, in my long career in magic is the rise of the Asian element. Uh, I went, right after the war, I went over to Japan. I was actually entertaining uh, troops there, Canadian and American uh, troops, um, as, as a back-for-back sort of thing. And uh, I got to see Japan right after the war. I was approached by so many young folks backstage uh, who wanted to get into magic. And they had all seen Channing Pollock. This is an interesting angle. They had already, they had seen Channing Pollock and uh, had one gentleman, a very serious young man, who approached me with his manager. And the manager spoke English very well, thank goodness. And uh, he explained to me that this young man wanted to go uh, to New York and wanted to get on the Sullivan Show. That was the big thing in those days, of course. And uh, they wanted my advice on how to go about this. And uh, deep from within my wise brain, I said, uh, yes. I suggest that you'd want to go over there and announce your, your, um, your arrival in great style with a press agent, and they hire a press agent, and dress in Japanese costume. Because America is very curious about uh, Asian folks, and particularly the Japanese. They want to get to know them. And uh, I think that would be a great success. And he translated to the artist, who then, ha, ha, subarashi desu. This gentleman speaks Japanese, so we can, we can have little chats on the side. Just like, <laughs> yeah, right. Baranoki o mite kudasai. No, I'll tell you what later. Yes. Watch your language. <laughs> Japanese, watch yours. Um, he was horrified, horrified that he should wear Japanese costume. And I was informed that he wanted to look like Channing Pollock because they had seen the movie, the famous movie, the nightclub movie with uh, Channing Pollock. European and, Nights was yes, the Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. My dad takes care of me with some things like that. And um, yes, and uh, they wanted to do dove magic. And I said, no, you'll never. There are hundreds of kids all over the place, and adults, of course, doing dove magic acts. And uh, they don't want that. They would like something flavored Asian. And uh, oh, no, no, we can't do that. He came over with his agent, without the press agent uh, stuff in advance and such, and he sort of vanished and went back to Japan. And I'm sure that they thought to themselves, I wish we'd listened to the old duck there with the beard because that could have been a sensation. That would have been wonderful. Because I had a connection with the Sullivan Show, even though I never played the show. But I had Mark Letty, the agent in New York. Who booked, booked it. all the Sullivan Shows. Yeah. And uh, it was a great gig for him, wasn't it? Oh, yes. Every act that went on the Sullivan Show went through Mark Letty. And uh, I could have talked to Mark, and I could have gotten him on the show in Japanese costume. But he wouldn't have any part of it. They all wanted to be Channing Pollock. And since Mark Letty was managing Channing Pollock, I would say the odds of getting a dove act on The Sullivan Show <laughs> rather, were rather, particularly low. Yes, very, very low, yes. So, so, that, so that was an interesting route, but we never, we never got to the answer to my question. Uh, what was the question? The question was, do you feel there's a difference between the magicians 
uh, who were prominent when, when you were coming up as a teenager and the magicians who were prominent now? Well, of course, the advent of uh, television uh, made a, a great deal of difference, and a, a great deal of difference, a phenomenal difference. Uh, and uh, I know I, I remember an episode with Harry Blackstone, uh, senior. Harry Blackstone, senior. I saw this in Canada. Oh, well, it's going to be a nice day after all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I saw a disaster with poor Harry. <laughs> He was doing his business where he had the, uh, I'm talking about senior now, up in Canada on a CBC uh, show there, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And um, he did a business where he wasn't aware of the fact that he was mic'd. He's used to, he was used to bellowing out at the audience like this. He never used a microphone on stage. And he had a great voice that carried to the far ends of the theater, I assure you. And uh, he got the fellow up on stage. <laughs> it was an audience participation thing where he had to cue the guy. And all of the cues came through very clearly. When I turned around, uh, give me a hush in the back. <laughs> and the guy said, yeah, of course. And <laughs> well, we heard every Free cue, and I sat there at home watching this in black and white TV, saying, "Oh no, no, no! It can't happen that way." Harry got over it, okay, but he wasn't aware of the fact that uh, you know it, that wasn't his niche. Right, and this is why Harry Jr. Yes. wore what's called a belly switch, so that even when his hands were occupied, he could, by yep. um, pushing out with his with his stomach, he could turn his microphone on and off. For, for such cueing, and he would do it. He did it with such uh, mm -hmm. precision that you would never catch it. I mean, it would take you many, many uh, and later hours of life, studying to see it to, to catch it. As his belly developed, he <coughs> would shut himself off inadvertently. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, boo, his. Um, one of the things that, that I, I wanted to, to bring up, uh, we do want to talk a bit about JREF which is the, uh, you've been involved in various organizations in the skeptical uh, mm -hmm. field, uh, but this one is the, the one that is ongoing and, and yeah. flourishing. Uh, one of the things that, that has been happening with JREF is the Amazing Meeting, yes. which is a convention in Las Vegas every summer. Mm -hmm. And you just had the ninth of the right. TAMs to right. the Amazing Meeting. TAM uh, for the Amazing Meeting. Exactly. And uh, how many people approximately were at the first one? Uh, there were 22 at the first one. Okay, <laughs> that's that not even approximate, in, that's precise. Yeah, that was not done in Vegas, that was done in Fort Lauderdale. It was okay. just a, a little try and we had right. 22 people. And how many were at the uh, one, one this past July? As 1,672. <laughs> that's a crowd. One of I was there. It was a terrific time, and there, as as with previous years, there there was some overlap uh, with magic. Uh, Jamie Ian Swiss has been involved, uh, I think, every year on the, on this. Oh yes. Uh, but also Penn and Teller, and uh, there are others who come in as guests. Michael Weber has performed, mm -hmm. Banachek, mm -hmm. uh, and a whole slew of, uh, of of magicians, people that the folks here would recognize. I was there this year, I had a great time, but one of the things that I found very interesting was the amount of diversity in the people there. Yes. Now, we're very proud of that, too. And, and uh, as well you should be. This, this, the reason I brought this up, I was thinking about it because today uh, is Martin Luther King Day. Yes. And so as, as I was listening to a news thing about that fact, it reminded me that at the amazing meeting, there was a very significant diversity, both ethnically, yes. but also uh, as far as gender. The, oh, there was yes. a, almost an equal number of women actively involved there as, as, as men. And actually, in terms of the speakers, I think it was almost exactly 50-50. Now, you've never seen a magic convention where the <laughs> ratios uh, uh, are like that. That's true. Uh, the, the age spectrum the was, age was spectrum very wide. Too. That's very important. Uh, so far as I could tell, the economic and, and uh, uh, cultural yes. spectrum. Highly varied. It's, it's a wonderful fact. Yes. My question is, how much of this is something that has deliberately happened uh, through outreach or something, and how much of it is just kind of mm -hmm. a natural, organic uh, growth? 
Well, for one thing, we've encouraged uh, uh, female speakers. We, there's no problem with that. There are some very competent, Harriet Hall, for example, is, uh, Dr. Harriet Hall, she is a wonderful speaker, and she does it regularly for us. We have attracted uh, this ethnic diversity, as I said, as you said, pardon me, and, and the, uh, the gender diversity as well. And we have all three genders there. Only <laughs> three. Only three. Well, <laughs> no, maybe four or five. I'm not too sure. But uh, in any case, the young folks that go in there too. Now, the women who go and the young folks who go don't go there to play the roulette wheels. Right. They go there because they want to hear what we have to say. Mm -hmm. And when we have um, diverse, di diverse groups afterwards of, of special uh, meetings and such in small rooms and whatnot, they all fight for one another in order to get into these things. It, the diversity of the kind of people that we attract to a skeptical meeting. Most of the skeptical meetings are middle-aged and older, paunchy, white gentlemen. And we You're don't talking have about that. skeptics meetings, not magic clubs. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me tell you the story of Jerry Anderson. The truth at, hurts. Jerry Anderson at the, at the Fort Lauderdale Magic Club. Okay. Oh, Jerry Anderson was a dear friend of mine. Oh, how I miss this man. Those of you who knew Jerry Anders would know that he was the most honest man in the world. He could not lie. He would have turned into a pile of dust if he had tried to lie. And he was a wonderful, very, very close friend of mine. I miss him dearly. Uh, but I, I celebrate the fact that he existed. I, I'm not mourning the fact that he's gone, but Jerry is up there or down there, I'm not sure. Uh, somewhere, he's sort of with us all the time. As a matter of fact, at the JRF meetings, we always have a table set out for Jerry Andrus with his illusions on it and a picture of Jerry Andrus right there. And that table will always be there at every meeting from now on. So, well, the least we can do, really the least we can do. So Jerry Andrus now, uh, he did a, hmm, he, he participated with us in so many ways. He was so much a part of our activity. And when, we, when it came down to uh, him doing special stuff for us, he would go out of his mind with it. He would try to arrange it. He would make phone calls. It's going to be a nice day, I'm sure. I said it, right? Uh, did you pay the bill? Uh, uh, that be may very, be a message be from, be from, from, from Jerry. It could yes, be. Uh, now, the, the, the Jerry Andrews thing, uh, he came out to my house. Uh, in New Jersey because he was lecturing at magic clubs in, uh, in New Jersey. And uh, that was a wonderful experience for me. He stayed at my home. He told me endless stories, some of them true, I'm sure. <laughs> and, oh yeah, he was very honest. And uh, he went out to the Fort Lauderdale Magic Club. Now the average age at uh, the Fort Lauderdale Magic Club is deceased. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the manager of the club and everything, the head of the club was a much younger man. And uh, when Jerry got out there, he sort of looked around him and he saw these, uh, these hoary old heads out there. That's a nice, that's a good expression actually, it's not a bad word, uh, out there. It looks like this. And um, he was uh, saying to me, well, I hope they understand what I'm going to say. Because Jerry's uh, stuff was on a very high level for the magicians. If you ever attended one of his lectures, very high level. And he had all of his, his pamphlets and books out there for sale. <laughs> uh, he gave his talk, and then he asked for questions. The first question he got was so inane that his heart sank. I could see him just sort of slump. And he answered it as best he could. The second question really set him off. And he turned to the manager and he said, uh, I, I guess that's the end of the uh, question period. Because they hadn't understood a thing he told them. <laughs> and they wanted to ask inane questions about thumb tips and such. Duh. And uh, so uh, the president of the club said, uh, OK, we'll now be uh, offering for sale these uh, books. And, and Jerry said, no, 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 I'm not going to sell the books. They, they wouldn't understand. <laughs> Well, that's because he was such an honest man. He knew they would go on a shelf or into a cabinet someplace and never be read. The, the cover would never be turned back in order to see any of the, the effects in it. But they just collected these pamphlets from every magician that came to town. And then the manager came over to him and gave him the check 
And he said, no, 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 I can't accept the check for this. Not, not for this show. No, they really didn't understand what I was saying. So I took the, from the check from the manager and I said, I'll get it. And I put it in my pocket. I took it home, got his checkbook, deposit slip in there, mailed it to his address in Eugene, Oregon. And he deposited it in the bank. I mailed, pardon, I mailed it directly to the bank. It was deposited in his account. He never knew that he got that check. <laughs> he would have been embarrassed. But that's the kind of guy that Jerry Andrus was. And uh, Jerry, thank you for being here. Indeed. Uh, many, of, many of the people here, of course, uh, remember Jerry because he used to come and work the close-up room uh, at least once a year. It was, oh, yeah. it was a, a guaranteed thing that he would come down and always have uh, new, new things to argue about, which was one of the hey, great things. To argue Jerry. about, exactly. Let's talk about some other people that you've known. One of the okay. things that was interesting to me at TAM was that there were certain people who, uh, whose names may or may not be well known to the general public, but who in the world of, of skepticism are rock stars. Oh, yes. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I'll name some of the ones that people would recognize. Uh, Richard Dawkins, for example, oh, yes. uh, was, was a huge uh, uh, figure at, 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 at this event. He's my uh, god. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Oh, yes. Uh, what a, car what a who, who wonderful was... speaker and a great character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. terrific. Um, tell them the story about the shoes. <laughs> yeah, the, the first uh, uh, TAM that uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, did for us, um, I went out to the airport to, to meet him, and uh, we dumped him into the car and drove him to the, uh, to the Monte Carlo, to the casino where we, we hold these things every year. And uh, we chatted. Uh, Amicably, very, very reachable gentleman, and uh, went to his room, and he started to unpack his suitcase while talking to us. He took a pair of shoes. Eat your hearts out on this. He took a pair of shoes, and he just tossed them at the cupboard. They both did this kind of a thing and ended up like that in the cupboard. <laughs> and he looked at it with a certain amount of satisfaction. He turned to me and said, I meant to do that. <laughs> I looked at him, and I said, I believe you. <laughs> So I can lie, too. See? There you go. But it, j just a beautiful move, a boom like that. And he was a little stunned by it, I'm sure. Maybe it was the ambiance of the place, or the vibrations. I'm not sure. But. Speaking of uh, rock stars in the world of skepticism and science and the like, brings up uh, a name who, who came up at dinner last night, actually, Carl Sagan, oh, goodness, who yes. you were quite close with and yeah. who uh, probably the single most famous scientist uh, to the American public mm -hmm. of, of the last several decades. Mm -hmm. Now, when Carl Sagan died a few years ago, uh, one of the things that surfaced about him yeah. uh, that had not been kind of well-known or publicly known oh, yeah. was that he was a pothead. Yes. That he, that he smoked yeah. marijuana oh, yeah. regularly. Oh, yeah. I'm not yeah. taking sides on this. But you were kind of public in, in being a bit shocked by this and, and uh, upset by it. No, I wasn't really upset, Mac, uh, Max. I was, I was surprised because it had never dawned on me. I, I had spent a lot of time with Carl, both at his home uh, in, uh, where is it, Cornell, New York? Or where is it? Yes, exactly. Oh, he was at Cornell, right? Yes, Cornell. Right. Sorry. Uh, and uh, and many, you know, I'd, uh, he'd been visiting us. He came to a lot of TAMs and such and, and lectured for us and such. And I knew him well personally, him and his wife, Andrew Inn. And uh, at that time, I knew Lynn Margulis, the former wife as well. And his, uh, well, a couple of his sons I knew. Uh, one of them very much into magic. Dorian Sagan. That's correct. And to whom um, I used to give lessons when he was about 14. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I did not know that. I'm proud of you. Thank you. Uh, yes. Well, anyway, uh, yeah, Carl, um, when I found out that, uh, that he was using uh, marijuana, let's face it, uh, we don't have to use slang terms for it, uh, I was quite surprised. But then I thought to myself, wait a minute. He was a very intelligent gentleman. He knew what he was doing. He knew, I'm sure, what his limits were. And I don't think he would have ever overdone it to drive, for example, after... Uh, after getting high, but if it made any difference in his career and made him uh, into the guy that he turned out to be, I've got to have a better understanding of it. And I've had a better understanding of it ever since. I've never involved myself in it, and that's my personal choice. But uh, no, I, I didn't have any trouble forgiving him for it. There's nothing to forgive, because he's a, a grown adult, you know. But I must, I must 
give you the event that, <laughs> that happened. I was sitting in my office with Andrew Main at the, the foundation headquarters in Port Lauderdale. <laughs> and uh, something came up. Uh, he was, uh, Andrew was sitting reading some, some mail and uh, on the couch in my office. And I saw something come up on my computer monitor there. And I laughed. And Andrew looked up and says, what's so funny? And I read him an astronomical joke, an astronomical joke off the screen. And uh, Andrew laughed. And I reached out like this, and my hand froze. And Andrew was looking at me. He said, what's the matter? And I really did this. I looked at my hand as if it was a strange thing that I'd never seen before. I said, Andrew, I was going to call Carl. Carl had been dead for years. And I was so shocked at what I was going to do. It was automatic to pick it up and go click, click. And he was number two on the dialer. And he, I knew he would answer at the other end, you see. I was going to read him the joke. I, I was horrified. I looked at my hand, and I immediately took him off the automatic dialer. I put Andrew in on the, on the dialer in the same place, same number uh, at his home. But what a shock that you don't realize that people that were that close to you uh, have actually gone. And you know you're not going to be able to talk to them again. That, a strange experience. Not without a round table and the proper exactly, candles. Yes. Oh, in that case, yes. Of course you could, yes. Yes. You've known, I mean, look, this comes partly with, with longevity. You are now 83? 83. 83. Yep. Oh, thank you. And... Uh, Going on 100, I always say, because I'm, I'm very ambitious. But, I mean, how many different places have you been in the, just in the past year? You've done several major tours. All, all, through, uh, all through Scandinavia. And, uh, yeah, I, I have been uh, on, on tour. I did Canada. I did nine cities in Canada in nine days, starting in Vancouver and going to Halifax. And that's the whole of Canada. So longevity is clearly... Part of what makes makes you you, uh, but one of the downsides of that is that uh, when the older one gets, the more people you know who yeah. who die. Yeah. Uh, someone once asked Di Vernon, "How do you deal with uh, <coughs> losing so many friends?" And his answer was, "You find younger friends." <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I want to bring up a couple of people who you knew. Uh, uh, here's a name that, that uh, someone mentioned this earlier, and, and I thought, what a good name to bring up. I'm, I'm interested in this. And it's a name that some people here will instantly know, and some won't, but we'll explain who it is. William Lindsay Gresham. Oh, my. Oh, yes. Now, well, I see some recognition in our yes. audience. Yes. To those who don't know, uh, Gresham was a writer. Uh, he wrote, uh, his most famous work was Nightmare Alley. He wrote... That what I think is the best biography of Houdini, uh, called Houdini the Man Who Walked Through Walls. Now it's it's filled with inaccuracies, but it's yeah, but it's true. the best read of all of all the Houdini biographies that I've ever yeah, read. Yeah. It's the most engaging uh, to read, if, read. If, if you're willing to ignore how many facts yeah, he got yeah. wrong. Uh, <laughs> But he also wrote other, other novels and, and other books and, and uh, uh, non-fiction works mm -hmm. and, uh, and was very in, immersed in the magic community. He was uh, based oh, in much. New York and knew a lot of people, including you. So I ask you, tell us uh, about your, what comes to mind when his name comes up. Well, if you have a copy of the book, I'm sure they'll all rush to get a copy of it now, uh, Houdini, the Man Who Walked Through Walls. I, I gave some assistance to, uh, to Bill and Gresham uh, in... I, I tried to get a lot of those errors out of there, but they were, they were too good. They sounded too good, <laughs> I guess, and he kept them in there. They, they weren't serious errors. Though. They were just uh, uh, maybe dates or whatever. But um, I gave him a lot of assistance on the book, and uh, it was in the very final stages. He had to rush it off to, uh, to uh, the printer. And uh, he promised me as a result, he said, you'll be the first and the last name in the book. So if you look at the copy of that, it's dedicated to me and on the dedication page. And when you go to the very end, it says thanks for all of his help and, and guidance to, me, to James Randi. So I'm, I'm the last one and the first one in the book. So there, ha ha. <laughs> the Alpha and Omega. Exactly, that's more. <laughs> yes. What kind of a guy was he? He was, um, he, he was a, 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 a very strange character. He lived in, um, I think it was, was it Croton Hudson or 
I forgot. Uh, anyway, yes, he, um, well, he was a great writer. Uh, he wrote m many books that you, you should read, really look up. Look, William Lindsay Gresham. Don't forget that. Uh, Google will tell you everything about him, I assure you. And uh, most of that is true. Uh, but uh, no, he, he had a, a great interest in magic. He got to know all the magicians. Such uh, he, uh, he traveled a great deal as well. Uh, he went all the way to England to research uh, a book that he never got, got written uh, on a spirit medium that he took an interest in. And he went to the uh, Society for Psychical Research, the uh, UK branch of the SPR, and uh, did a lot of research there. And unfortunately, I lost track of his wife after he died, and I've not been able to track it because I'm sure she has the notes that he made. Mm. Uh, th those would be wonderful to see because he, he really was a good, good researcher. He, he tried very hard to get these facts together. The Houdini story, he fluffed up a bit. We, we admit that. Yes, but again, great read. Yeah, it was good fluffing. Uh, one of the uh, uh, interesting things about Gresham, Ray Hyman, who was a, yes. a longtime friend of, of yours and was very close with Jerry Andrus because uh, mm -hmm. oh, yes. Ray's based up in the Portland area now. And uh, Ray, in addition to being uh, uh, an academic and, and a very fine magician, he has a particular interest in uh, the topic of cold reading, uh, something that I'm sure most people And Ray is a psychologist are, by, by yeah, profession. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Ray is uh, not certain of this, but, but he thinks that the first time the word cold reading with the, the meaning that we mm -hmm. ascribe to it now of, yes. of telling people things about themselves uh, on the fly without prior knowledge, uh, that the first time that appeared in print may have been in Nightmare Alley. Yes. The, the, the term well is nowhere near as old, yes. at least in terms of being established in print, it's nowhere near as old as we tend to think of it. We assume it goes back to the to the uh, uh, 19th century, mm -hmm. uh, but at least in terms of, it, it may have been in, in the spoken vernacular, mm -hmm. but uh, but I haven't found an earlier uh, example of its use. I don't know uh, of the... Uh, Nightmare Alley was around 1946 or earlier? 47, 48. 47, okay. And, and so... Uh, and Tyrone Power played the... the uh, in, lead, in the film. Yeah. ...lead in that film, and Gresham was really disappointed in the film, because it didn't really... Well, there were lots of sexy bits in the, in the novel, but uh, none of that was used. That was Hollywood in those days. And, uh, but he was sort of disappointed that it didn't really round out the character of uh, the The film has some very powerful stuff, and it's finally been released uh, mm -hmm. just a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, it was tied up, the rights were tied up for a oh. long time, and so uh, all during most of the, the video era, you couldn't get it. But, uh, but it, it is now out and, and uh, on DVD. I hope they haven't colorized it. <laughs> I, I would hope not. I would certainly hope not. Um, let's jump around a little bit. We, we touched momentarily on, on, on seances. Uh, and, and somehow that, that gives me a segue uh, into a piece of uh, a videotape that I would like to, uh, to introduce or have you oh, introduce. Okay. Uh, this is my single favorite clip of James Randi. And uh, Thomas, have we got, uh, yeah, this is Which Thomas one? who is part Which of the Which one is this? Uh, this is the one where you went on to a little show called The Tonight Show, hosted by Johnny Carson. A few times, 22 times over the years. But on this particular occasion, you decided to do a demonstration of psychic surgery. Oh yes, uh, but uh, yes, um, we we uh, we went outside to see the audience, the potential audience, standing outside in line, waiting to get into the studio. And I went along, and I I, I chose a reasonably corpulent gentleman, uh, and uh, asked him if he'd volunteer, and he gladly uh, gave permission. Now this this is psychic surgery, so called. Uh, that, that those words are in quotes. Imagine that, okay. Uh, and we, now, stage blood is terrible. It stains the skin, which blood won't do. Uh, and it, it's just not compatible with a really good demonstration. So the blood you're going to see here is real. <laughs> but it came from Carson's secretary. She actually went 
to the, the resident nurse there Whoa. at NBC. Whoa. And uh, she volunteered to have 20 cc's of her blood taken. Whoa. Now, that's, that's dedication. That's dedication, you've got to admit. And uh, she didn't mind at all. She was a good sport about it all. And so the blood I'm using here is really blood. And I make a joke. <laughs> I make a joke uh, halfway through this thing. Because the tension building in the audience was quite considerable, quite considerable. And uh, I had to make a bit of a joke. And I, I think you'll know when the joke comes. I hope you'll laugh. May I also mention, I'm not going to reveal the joke. You'll, you'll see it. But you told me, and I was very impressed by this, that the joke was an ad lib. Yeah. You had not pre-planned it, but rather you felt that there was so much tension yeah. and you came up with this gag on the spot. And I think yeah. it's one of the great moments uh, Cause in I was, I, was, I was seeing people literally in the audience doing this kind of thing and looking away. And said, I didn't want them to do that. So it, it sort of broke the tension. So without further ado, this is from 86 approximately? Uh, many years ago, yes. Yeah, <laughs> some mid-1980s. This is James Randi. Uh, demonstrating something which at the time was kind of a brand oh, new yes. sensation. Uh, people were reading about it and there were books coming out about it. And this was probably the first time that almost anyone in the American viewing audience had a chance to see psychic surgery. A lot of people who go down there and pay good money. You all set? And be all right, we have our patient. It's all yours. Oh. Now, this is the time to look away if you if you need to, because it's going to get a little gory from now on. The psychic surgeons of the Philippines are, um, how are you feeling, Sandy? Okay? Everything's fine. They're pretty heartless folks. They just don't much care for the feelings of people. They don't certainly care for their health at all. And, of course, they're not in any way trained to do this sort of thing. They just put on an act as if they are trained. Now, what you're about to see is a barehanded operation which appears to take place by actually penetrating the body. Believe me, what you're seeing is strictly special effects, it's sleight of hand, and nothing more. And this is the way it looks. I can't watch this. <laughs> Great sound effects, too. Anything that gets down there, we don't get it on your trousers if we can help it. Um, let me see. That's a bit better, just a second, just one second now. Maybe better for you. <laughs> <laughs> you don't feel any better? The strange thing is, after this operation is all over, now, mind you folks, I want you to bear in mind, please, 
that people are showing this as if it were really serious, as if it actually did take place, and as if surgery were really performed. People do this, they go to the Philippines, they spend their money, and they frankly return home, in most cases, to die. It's a little bit funny to watch it, perhaps, and you say, gee, I know it's play acting, but it's not play acting when they go by the tens of thousands every year. Sanford, I want to thank you for being a wonderful volunteer. I think you deserve a round of applause for that. Thank you. Really? Okay, we'll, uh, we'll leave that editorial alone. Can I wash my hands? <laughs> that still has a, a pretty powerful uh, oh, yeah. zing to it uh, oh, these does, many yeah. years later. How did you practice that? Well, that was my dad, actually, on the table. Yeah. No, uh, I had done it at many lectures uh, before that, when it was an item that was in the news all the time. Right. Yes. I mean, this was getting the, the psychic surgery thing, which was located mostly mm -hmm. in the Philippines, a little bit in South America, yeah. and, and uh, it was huge. There were, oh, yeah. there were uh, uh, major articles about it in Time Magazine and the equivalent, uh, and, and television reports and so forth. And, and, uh, well, I, I just uh, worked out a, a couple of methods of doing it. Uh, that was a combination of two different methods. Uh, of, of doing the, the same effect, and I uh, hope you didn't catch me. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's not too difficult to do. I could teach anyone to do that. Really. Now, now, had you, in, in researching this, had you had the opportunity to actually go and witness uh, no, a psychic I, surgeon? No, I could, or, couldn't or get into a thing like that. But uh, I, I, in seeing some of the films, some place it was very evident what they were doing. They were really bad at it, but they didn't have to be good at it because the people already believed that they were doing miracles. So uh, it, it worked no matter what, and they collected a lot of money. They got fabulously wealthy on it. And this was back in the days, now with, with cable television and literally hundreds of channels to choose from, uh, the, the television pie is split up into very small pieces, yeah. and even uh, the, the, the broadcast shows get compared to the old days, get very small ratings. Mm -hmm. This was when Carson owned the night. Oh, yeah. And, and so the number of people oh. who would watch the Carson show and talk about it the next day was huge. You couldn't, literally could not walk down the street if you'd been on the, right. on the Carson show the night before. What was the kind of reaction that came in the days following this particular appearance on Carson? Well, uh, it, it, was, it was very, oh, the mail I got. I, I've got boxes full of it, really. Uh, you're a terrible person. This is a spiritual thing. You should not make fun of spiritual things. And these are holy men of God, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of people saying, good for you. I'm glad that you exposed this sort of thing. But I was on my way to Japan a couple of months after that, and I stopped in the Philippines because I'd gotten requests from the newspapers there. And I st stopped in the Philippines, tried to get through immigration, and they stopped me. Now, uh, what was his name, the uh, dictator? Uh, Marcos. Marcos. Yes, Marcos. Thank you. I, I get a lot of stuff out of this. Uh, yeah, uh, Fernand Marcos was the uh, dictator of the Philippines at the time, and he knew this was a good piece of business that was bringing in millions of dollars uh, in tourist money uh, to the Philippines, and he wasn't about to let that happen. So I was escorted by the police to the hotel that I was staying at, and I had two guards outside my door to make sure I didn't get out. And I was essentially under uh, house arrest or hotel arrest, I guess you could call it. Uh, at that time, I stayed there for three days and uh, I appealed to the American consulate. I couldn't get any answer out of them. I called the Canadian consulate and they came around right away. I was a Canadian citizen at the time, so they, that made them react rather quickly. And uh, I was escorted to the uh, airport and put on a plane and I continued on to Japan. So we know at least uh, it was before 1987. Yes. Because that's when you changed yes. citizenship. Exactly. Uh, is that, <laughs> this is an odd question to ask, is that the only time you've had a situation where government agents held you in your <laughs> hotel room or oh, yeah. tried to push yeah, you out yeah, of the that, country? That was, that was the only time that happened. It's, uh, it's not a pleasant experience, I can tell you. You never know whether someone's going to come out in the, in, along in the middle of the night and do you darns.
I mean, yeah, they could they could do all kinds of uh, of surreptitious things. We magicians know about surreptitious stuff, of course, you see, but they could do deadly surreptitious stuff. And uh, and Marcos was a beast. He was a, a, a total beast. Uh, the best thing that ever happened to the Philippines is uh, him dying. That's a, that's a good thing for the Philippines and for the world, I would say. Not so good for the shoe industry. No, 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 no. The, the, the women's shoe industry took a nosedive after that, of course. And Melda Marcos had like something like 1,400 pairs of shoes that she had accumulated. Well, if you time. have to explain them, it's... No, no, no. It, 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 it loses impact, yes. Um, I have, speaking of, of, of the things like uh, uh, performing psychic surgery, I notice that sitting on the floor right down oh, there, yes. uh, there is uh, a check. Checkbook. A checkbook, but the top check on there says uh, it, it's made out for one million dollars. That's correct. Uh, the, from uh, the James Randi Foundation, the Educational Foundation, I should yes. say. Uh, there's only one flaw. Not a flaw, it's a, it's a provision. Let's put it that way, yes. It says, pay to the order of, and that's blank. You can enter your own name. And then it says at the bottom, prove any paranormal ability and we'll replace this fake check with a real one. So there. And uh, we give these out as souvenirs, and it does advertising on the back. It tells about my family business and a few things like that. But, yes. And I will mention that through the good graces of, uh, of DJ Grothy and, and J. Ref, we have enough of these that there's one for everyone here. Oh, boy. That's one check a piece, not a full pad of them. Yes. And but, uh, but we have a, a whole bunch of them uh, back there, so uh, at the end of the evening's conversation, uh, we'll manage to distribute them. And uh, anybody who wants to apply, uh, the information on how to do it is right here. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've already how to apply, not how to win. Right. <laughs> I, I've already taken mine, just oh, okay. in advanced preparation. He's already entered his name on the payees. <laughs> as you yeah. Now, uh, this, this uh, brings up an interesting point, however. Uh, I made an offer some time ago. Now, there is a million dollars in a special account. It's 1.2 something uh, million at the moment. We have reached into that fund every now and then and taken some of the interest off the top to help run the foundation when we've needed extra funding. Um, that is a genuine offer. And I put up on SWIFT, named in honor of Jonathan Swift, our webpage, uh, I put up a notice quite some time ago saying that if there's any doubt whether the million dollars exists, all you have to do is get in touch. I give phone number, email address, the whole thing, everything that is needed. And uh, people are still claiming, the so-called psychics out there, saying, oh, no, I investigated. There's no million dollars. That's a fake. Yeah. You know, he's a magician. He lies about these things. Yeah. Uh, there, there is no million dollars. Well, there is a million dollars that was given to us by an obviously very wealthy man who contributed uh, to our cause. And um, it's sitting in the bank, and it's waiting to be snapped up. Now, we have not received one request for the documentation that the prize actually exists. And yet psychics all over the world are still saying, I, I get notices on it every day saying, oh no, I checked it out, there is no money. Uh, that is a fake <laughs> offer altogether. But no one has ever applied for the evidence. There, there's a message. That, that's correct, yes, yes. This is D.J. Grothy, our president, by the way. Very and proud for, those of you, for those of you who couldn't hear what D.J. just said, uh, the information about the contest, or contest challenge, call it what you will, uh, is online. Uh, the statement about, their, the, the, about the real existence of this funding mm -hmm. is there. Uh, speaking of the, the, this challenge, uh, not too long ago, there was an episode of, was it Nightline on, on ABC, uh, where... Uh, representing JREF, there was uh, Banachek, yes. uh, and, and typing in the background was Jamie Ian Swiss, and uh, they conducted, in, they went to New York and conducted several tests to applicants, uh, none of which panned out oh, for really? the applicants. Yeah. Uh, but how did you feel that was handled in terms of how ABC presented it? Because I know sometimes you, you feel, I, with, with reason, uh, mm -hmm. that you are not given uh, yeah. a, a fair representation. representation. Yeah.
No, I, I was, uh, we were reasonably satisfied, weren't we, DJ? Yes, reasonably satisfied. ABC did its best uh, and, and did very well, so we're, we're gr very grateful uh, to them for that. But uh, we did, we did a stunt too. That DJ was behind this. I thought this was a corny stunt, and I was wrong, DJ. I apologize profoundly. Uh, he announced that he was going to send uh, some, um, let's say, uh, actors. Uh, out to see James von Prague when he was doing one of his sessions. He charges a huge amount of money. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's a lot of money just to sit in an audience and have him tell you vapid stories and uh, do cold reading with you. And he doesn't do it all that well, frankly. One of his favorite stunts in the cold reading stunt, you, you, you folks know what cold reading is, of course, okay. And, uh, but one of his stunts, I'd love to see it, and you can see him do it so frequently. Uh, he'll say something like, I, I'm, I'm getting, uh, an M name. Uh, it's, uh, it's. I think it's Michael. Do you do you know a Michael? And uh, the the uh, the victim will say, "Oh yes, Michael was a member of my family. Uh, yes, he was a, a cousin, uh, I believe, wasn't he?" And she'll say, "No, no, he wasn't a cousin. Uh, he was my brother." And he'll say, "Yes, because he's just saying to me that he wasn't a cousin. He was a brother." <laughs> Now this is, this is quick, it's quick thinking, but it's a very standard thing with Von Prague and all the cold readers. They give back to you what you just told them, and then when you grab the person after and say, how impressed were you with that? They say, well, he knew who Michael was. He identified him. No, he didn't. You told him that. Oh, no, no, no. But that's exactly what they did. They, they reconstructed differently, and a good cold reader should be able to make people believe that that's the way it happened. Now, I know some of the television shows, I've certainly not seen anywhere near all of your television appearances. I have a life to live, but, uh, and, there, and, and there are a lot of them is my point. There are a lot of them, but, but I do recall uh, several times uh, seeing you on the Larry King show, oh, yes. where uh, they would put you on usually with one or two uh, psychics, uh, such as James John Prague or Sylvia Brown or one of those. And uh, I felt, at least, when watching this, that Larry King was not being very even-handed on this. And, and I don't know Larry King. He, he, he well, seems like a nice enough guy, but... He's smart enough to know better. Uh, but Larry and I have always gotten along rather, rather well. I realize he has to do a program. It has to be something that gets a lot of attention. Uh, his producers are, are very... Uh, adamant that there has to be some woo-woo in the thing that will survive the program and not be completely drowned. Uh, but uh, in, in later years, he got worse and worse on me, and uh, I did many, many, Larry, I don't know how many Larry King shows I did, but uh, I, I did a, a great number of them. Oh, I, I got to tell you a Larry King story. He'll hate me for, for saying this, but I, he used to do a radio program right after he did taping when he was in the Washington area. And he asked me before the program, he said, will you come and do the radio show after? I said, yeah, sure. Well, I was in town, and I had the opportunity to do it. So we did the, the TV bit. I don't know who was on with me at the time. <laughs> then then uh, he said, we'll go over and do the radio show now in a, in a small studio, but it had a big reach, that radio program. And I, I was talking. I was delivering some tirade of some kind of or another, and I looked over at Larry, and Larry was sound asleep. <laughs> he had dozed off, and he was literally like this. And you could see the, the, the body doing the deep breathing thing. And I looked over, and I had to carry on in the program. I had to continue the conversation, and I kept on doing the business on the table, and he wasn't moving at all. Then suddenly, he looked up and looked around, and I said, uh, but Larry, what do you think? <laughs> And then I, I had to save him. I, I said, I mean, regarding the fact that, and I gave, a, I gave the details of what I'd just been talking about, and he fell right in with it. He sort of smirked at me, but he fell right in with it. But he, had, he was literally snoring on my <laughs> that, was, that was very gracious of you to, to let him off Yeah, I hook. thought so, yes. <laughs> but when you would have an experience on, let's say, on The Larry King Show, mm -hmm. where it came out feeling very not even-handed, mm -hmm. uh, and where he uh, enabled some of uh, yeah. your, your <coughs> adversaries, let's say, uh, in ways that didn't necessarily make you look good. 
did this lead to discussions prior to your next no. visit on the show? No, not really, because the exposure was so valuable. Any kind of exposure on the Larry King was, uh, show was very valuable. And I figured to myself, I should be able to hold my own. You know, I, I've been around for a while, and I, I, I should have the experience to get around these things. I did uh, generally uh, rather well. Um, but I guarantee Larry had a program to do, and he knew, and he was getting feedback in his earpiece as well. You know, make him look like a fool or something. I, I, I don't know what was being said, but uh, he was getting cueing at the same time. Yeah, the Peter Popoff approach. Exactly. <laughs> well, we're, we're talking about a lot of different television things, and uh, one of the TV clips that I know we have lined up on the computer, uh, you specifically said you wanted to show, and it's, it's been so long since I've yes. seen it, I, to be honest, have forgotten the details, except I know it's from the 1970s, and it's on uh, Barbara yes. Walter's morning show. I yes. believe uh, the show was called uh, Not For Women Only. Not For Women Only, yes. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a, a network show. It was ABC first called For Women Only, and then they changed it, Not For Women Only, very wisely, very wisely. So this was a, a daytime show with, with a, a huge viewing audience. Yes. And this was on an episode where there were, you were not the only magician involved. And as we can and see... And you see Doug Henning and Mark Wilson sitting there. Mark Wilson there. in the middle and Doug Henning off to the right. And, now, uh, now let, let me tell the, the surrounding up, on this thing. Now, uh, he, she had, Barbara had a dreadful little woman who hated my guts. She hated all magicians and such, and she made it very obvious. Uh, but, uh, you know, Wilson we're gonna, and uh, Henning were going to talk about general things and magic and such, but I was sort of under the gun. And I wanted to set up a thing whereby uh, the Geller drawing thing, where he had it sealed up in an envelope and he'd be able to tell you what it was. Now, the way Geller does it, he has it done right in front of him in, in, the, uh, in the dressing room with mirrors all around and everything. I guess we can figure out methods for, for doing that sort of thing, you see. Uh, and, of course, that isn't mentioned when they get on camera that the drawing was made in the dressing room with Geller, who's, uh, who, who's shielding his eyes like, like this, you see. <laughs> and um, in any case, I had to work out a method of doing it. Now, they, on the tables uh, that the audience sat at, they had these yellow pads uh, with a Barbara Walter show or something uh, on them, and uh, they had ruled line, and they had a pencil attached to each, each one of them. And uh, this is well before the show. And I said to, to Barbara, I, I said, well, Barbara, here, um, why don't you make a, go over in the corner there and make a drawing? Now, I had prepared it in such a way that I would know what the drawing was from uh, what they call, what was it called? Carbon paper. You remember carbon paper? <laughs> yeah, I did it a little more subtly than that. I did it with soap, actually, but it's, that's another story altogether. Which and, uh, an idea that you published in Ibidem magazine true, in Ibidem. the 1950s. From Howard Lyon. A Canadian in, magic journal. Canada, so. yes. Oh, yes. Many, many moons ago. And uh, so I gave the pad to Barbara, and she went over to the side of the room, and her producer came over and took the pad away from her. No, she didn't know how it was done, but she just said, no, we'll do that in the dressing room, Barbara, and she threw it down, and she led Barbara into the dressing room. And Barbara came out of the dressing room sometime later with an envelope, and I told her, I said, no, seal it in a second envelope as well, Barbara, to make sure that I can't see through the envelope. And the producer sort of did this kind of thing, saying, what, what is going on here? You'll see in a moment why. But uh, uh, so Barbara went back and then came back with the envelope in a book. And I knew I wasn't going to get to that book. And I looked at, at Wilson and at Henning, who were already uh, seated on the set. The audience was just coming in at this point. And uh, I looked at Wilson and I said, did you get a pink? And uh, he said, no. And I looked at Henning and I said, uh, how about you? No, I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> so I knew I was on my own. And I had to use a technique which, if you watch carefully here, this is a bad quality videotape. I, I apologize for that. But uh, you may see the gimmick that I used. If so, just nod quietly and look smug, okay? <laughs> and then I'll tell everybody afterwards what it was. Watch. And it's been tested by the Stanford Institute and by other scientists and is said to have psychic powers. We had the uh, former astronaut Edgar Mitchell on with us who believes in very much in Uri Geller. And Randy, you've been going around the country, somewhat as Houdini used to in the past, trying to debunk those who say that it's psychic power. You say it's magic. 
Well, Barbara, you see, in what you said just now is something rather revealing to me because you say that he's been tested by the scientists at the Stanford Research Institute. First of all, Stanford Research Institute is not connected in any way with Stanford University, though it happens to be on the grounds. It takes its name from its, its locality. And the Stanford Research Institute, as an institute, did not test Uri Geller. Two scientists there whose specialty is lasers, nothing to do with psychology, nothing to do with conjuring, certainly, whose specialty is lasers, went through some private tests with Uri Geller under anything but test conditions. And since then, the psychology department down there, and I've read this in one of the psychological journals, has tested him, gave him a hundred envelopes that he was supposed to guess the contents of, and he failed each and every well, one of the hundred. Let me show some things he did with me. Uh -huh. And I'm, I'm a pretty honest person, okay? I mean, we all know all it. Right, I understand uh, that, no yes. kidding. This is my house key. Mm -hmm. Uri Geller took it. Let's take this other one. It's a matching key. He went like this with it, with his finger. That's all. No pressure. And the key bent. You can see that. And I've carried it around because I found that I'm a believer now. He also, people in the audience said that their keys bent. Well, I can't prove that, but I can prove that mine did. Here is my identical key. Touch it and make it bend. Now, I'm we have another piece today. of metal. I need another piece of metal. He didn't use metal. He just used his finger. No, that's very true. That's very true. But I want, I want to show you a okay, comparison. Okay, another Any... Give me my, another key. That's now, this the is the bent one. one. Now, which camera is taking this? Can we, can we get a close-up here now? All right, now, that's the okay, you can one. see the bent one here. There is a, a definite bend in here. Is that right? right? Okay. okay, now watch. Watch it very carefully. I am going to see if I can... This is a different one from this one. This one's a duplicate, am I correct? Right. This one has a stamp on it saying 207 West something. This doesn't have a stamp on it. You see the little stamp on it there? Yeah. Would you hold the end of it very lightly in between your fingers, Barbara? And I'm just going to stroke it. Now, I'm not putting enough pressure on it to bend it. No. Okay, I'm just going to stroke it with my fingers very lightly like this. Now, look at the bend that's in the other key. No, I won't take my eyes off this key. <laughs> Very good. I'm glad to hear you say that. Would you show it to the camera, please? Now, is it bent as much as this key or not? Are you going to keep this key too, Roger? On your key chain? Next, Barbara spoke about the drawing replication trick, one of the only five tricks that Geller has ever been known to do. Her producer had challenged me to do it, hoping for a failure, of course. Barbara had made a drawing to test me and carefully kept it in her hot little hand right until she showed it on the set. Both Mark and Doug thought I'd go down in flames, but I had a couple of twists for them and for the audience. Show the Uri, the, the Uri oh, we're going to show a tape. Okay, okay, very good. Okay, can good. we show that? This is where he read my mind and reproduced a picture that only I had. Okay, just a second, look at me. Visualize everything that you drew once more. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show what I got. And if I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. But it really came very strong in. I'll just I'll tell you what first I thought it was and what it comes to appear now. Uh, first, I thought there were two churches with peaks on, or two houses. Then he turned to a letter M, and then he, uh, it could be two mountains with a round thing on, or two people. I, I, uh, Can I show? I, yeah, I'd like to. Am I wrong? You're right. I'm right. Good. That's what I got. The this letter M, got. if you got a letter M, yeah, it may not be because of that, but because my drawing is a drawing similar to one that my child does. It's a mother and child. Oh, that's... Oh. Oh. This is it. We have not had this, this envelope out of our sight. Randy has in no way been close to it. The closest you've been to it, to my knowledge, is, is right now. now. Reproduce Did you put it back in the book? I want to make sure that it is under good control. <laughs> All right, Barbara, I'm going to ask you to concentrate on what's drawn inside there. What's the point of concentrating? I know not. Watch this, Wilson. I may surprise you. Surprise me. May surprise everybody. You concentrating on what you drew in there? You said to Mark, watch this, Wilson. I don't want you to see the end of the pen movie. You may look and say, hmm, how it doesn't look quite right. You saw the body of the city. It's tragic. <laughs> I'm a very bad artist. You'll have to pardon me, Barbara, but uh, all right. I've made what I believe to be an impression of it. Now, 
It can't be altered in any way. Would you be kind enough to open up the envelope and let's see how right I was? Oh, I, like Eric says, thanks God, I hope I'm right on this. <laughs> That's the way he says it to me. Well, open it up and show it to the cameras, if you'd be so kind. Where's the cameras? Here's a camera. Is that a house? It's a little, well, I don't draw and so well. It's a little house and a sun, okay. and here's a little person. A house, that's the house, that's the sun, and that's a little person. Well, you'll pardon me for being a very bad artist, uh, Barbara, but I didn't get the sun at all. I got the little person, but I got the little person inside the house and the smoke coming out to the top here. That's all we could get out of it. This, can't see it. Thanks, God, I'm you a, got it. Thanks, thanks, God, I got this. <laughs> yes. Yes, we got the house with the... debunk this man whom everybody believes tell you have to tell us how you do it i'm going to add the sun here to make my results a little bit better how, how about that folks <laughs> yes you can't quite see wrong that i made this was made with a simple bolt on cap not a glove all oh, right. Uh, boy, I haven't seen that in so many years. I'd forgotten the bit about adding the sun yeah after the fact. That's, Did anyone see the gimmick? Funny. I'm talking about the envelope trick now. First of all, there's a bit cut out of there because she had to remove the outside envelope, and then I asked her to hold it up to the light to make sure that she couldn't see through the envelope. And she said, well, maybe I can a little bit. And I said, okay, then, well, open up the envelope. And I'd already made the, the drawing, apparently. Yeah. I used a, a new invention. You'd heard, I've heard of thumb writers, of course. Yeah. This is a belly writer. If you look at it carefully, if you, see, if you see that again, I had simply taken a pen off the table and I had stuck it with the active end out here in my belt like this. Oh my God. And I simply kept my hand in front of it. And when the time came, I, I took the, the paper. Like, and when I said, uh, watch this, Wilson, I had already caught a glimpse, a glimpse of through the the thin envelope of what it was. And I started to draw. And I was doing this and moving back and forth and uh, as, I, as I would move towards her, I would, I was writing the, the thing with my belly. Uh, and it certainly worked well enough. Have you had any contact with Miss Walters since oh, yes. then? Oh, many times, yes. And, and did she come round to, to feeling you were not uh, a threat to her belief system? Or? Oh, yeah. No, no. Barbara said... She's a very bright lady, and she's very, uh, very active and, and very, uh, you know, very alert and such. But um, she always asked me, "How did you do that thing <laughs> with the drawing?" I mean, she did. She does ask me that, and it's our running gag, more or less. Uh -huh. I've never cracked. Now, don't tell Barbara Walters. Here, okay? <laughs> so I want this gag to go on forever and ever and ever. Now, you may have noticed that, that as uh, uh, we were turning off the video, uh, it was clear that this was a YouTube uh, video. Yeah. In fact, uh, JREF has a YouTube channel with a lot of, oh, yeah. a lot of footage, as well as uh, some audio podcasts and, and just a lot of things. And they have just recently been informed that the JREF channel is in the top 10 Nonprofit channels on all of YouTube, <laughs> which is which is pretty impressive. Oh yeah! And any of you who missed the uh, the the first conversation we had here, you can see it on uh, there, back yeah. in September of uh, 2010, a little yeah. over a year ago. Uh, it is up on the uh, yeah. on on the JRF channel, so uh, you you can you can find all the stories that we've jumped over this time. Yes, indeed. So. How are we doing for time, by the way? Uh, we're good. Oh, How okay. are you guys doing for time? Yeah? <laughs> All right. I want to move into something a little bit uh, special to make good on a promise we made a year and a couple of months ago. Uh, the last time we did a talk, uh, we, we had you offer to, to perform something, not on video, but what? right here. And, uh, and then we wound up out of time. And so we agreed that when you came back, oh, yes. you would perform something. So I believe you have something that you intend to perform. I don't know what it is, and I don't know uh, 
I saw your eyes drop down towards Well, I saw this. I figure that might have something to do with it. It does indeed. All right. It does indeed. Shall I, um, now, shall I yes, leave and get out of the no, way or no, 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 stand no, here and no, add no, color? No, I mean, it's, it's no, up no. to you. I'm not afraid of you, Max. <laughs> not very afraid of you. But, um, you know, this, is a, this is a mentalism trick. If mentalism bores you, you can leave the room. But, um, a mentalism trick that I developed some time ago, and I've often done this uh, at my various lectures around the world, and it works in all languages. Uh, oh, I'll be showing you all of this stuff in a second here. Wait till I dip down very deep into the bag here. And uh, this is what we reveal to your anxious gaze. All right. Now, these are, uh, they're printed by the bicycle company. I don't know whether you knew this or not, but giant ESP cards, uh, a circle, plus mark, wa three wavy lines, the square, and the five-pointed star. Now, actually, there are numbers to these things. I, didn't know, I, I always do them by numbers. That has one line. This has two lines. This has the three wavy lines, four sides of a square, and a five-pointed star. So one, two, three, four, five, you see. And um, I have here a whole, oh, you get quite a few envelopes here into which these will fit. But even more importantly, these are folded pieces of black paper, quite, quite opaque, I assure you. And uh, I'm going to hand these out to uh, members of the audience here. Now, these are, are not confederates of mine. Are you there, Sam? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to um, hand these uh, envelopes out to, uh, you can take these if you would be so good. Would you shuffle them up? Make sure that they're all mixed. And these, uh, we're only going to use five of these, and there's quite a number here. Sir, would you shuffle these up? All righty. We'll see how well they shuffle envelopes and such. And. Um, these five cards here, I'm going to ask you to, uh, this gentleman right here can do it for me. Uh, you've seen the, the cards very plainly, one, two, three, four, and five. I'm going to ask you to turn them face down and then shuffle them up very thoroughly while, while I look away and make sure that you don't know which card is which, okay? Okay, now, <clears throat> let us, um, you can be my... Uh, I go between. Would you right. would you go down to the end of the row here, and ask the one, two, three, four? Yeah, the the five people on the end of the row there to select uh, any one of those those envelopes. Okay. Each one of them. Okay. So if the envelopes are marked in any way, this is impossible to tell anything. But I'll take the rest of the envelopes here if you would be so kind. Thank you very much. I was going to ask for a round of applause for you, but that would take too much time. Yes. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, where is the, the black? Uh, yes, would you go down to the end there and distribute, uh, or distribute, ask them to choose one of the black folding pieces, please. So if these were marked or specially gimmicked with little beads, oops, sorry, beads or anything in the corner, uh, this randomizes the whole thing. Okay. So five of them have been handed out, and I'll take the rest of them. Thank you so much. Okay. Now, you have these cards mixed up. Yeah. Now, I, I shouldn't be looking towards you at all, but we're going to remedy that as well. I want you to go down there, and each of you folks, when you take one of these cards, keep it face down. I don't want you to know what it is, okay? So go down to the road, keeping the faces out of sight, and distribute those cards, or ask them to choose one. Keep them down so they, you, they can't see what they're, what they're getting. Okay, now, you five people, listen carefully to the instructions. I want you to take your card without looking at it, place it inside the black piece of paper. Okay. And take it and put it inside the envelope. Just slide it inside the envelope. Very good. Okay, now, uh, you can use the clasp on it, or you can lick the, the, the gum on it, or whatever you want, or you can do both, depending on how secure you want to feel. <laughs> okay? Now, when those have all been done, now, would you pass them up to this fifth gentleman right here, pass them down, down the road, and I want him to mix them up thoroughly, turn them over, and completely randomize them. Now, this is as fair a shuffle as you're ever going to get. 
Very good. Oh, look at that. He did a double lift. Just wonderful. <laughs> okay, so they're mixed up in such a way, sir, that you don't know which one is the original envelope that you had, for example. All right, are they, are they sealed? I see it's a flap. It's flapping on one of them. Oh, no, no, it's, it's sealed. Oh, okay, all right. Now, uh, bring them to me if you'd be, be so kind. Now, uh, we really, have we got better light here? Uh, because, uh, no, I guess, I guess we can't. Can't do much with it, but in any case, here are five envelopes. Now, there are several ways that uh, are solutions that have been offered uh, to me for this, and I want you to. Uh, it's very difficult for you folks in the back. I'm sorry you can't see, and we don't have a camera on this, but uh, nonetheless, I well, I'll hold them up on the other side, and you'll. See if you get the idea now. Each one of these envelopes has a card of which I do not know the identity. I think you'll agree mm -hmm. with me on that, okay? Yeah. Fair enough? Now, I'm going to pick, watch, for, uh, the people in the front row have to be the witness for this, but I'm going to pick up each envelope, or one envelope here to start with, by the extreme corner, and I'll hold it up like this so you can see it, okay? Now, th this is hard to, Oh, I'm sorry, put my finger on the other side. Um, holding it up between two fingers like this, you'd say to yourself, wait a minute, is there a bead in the, in the corner of the envelope? Well, if there were, the envelopes are already mixed up anyway, right? So that's not going to make any difference. I think you'll agree with that? Right. Okay. Now, hmm. All right, so much for that one. For this one, I can pick it up by an opposite corner. For example, so <laughs> there shouldn't be any possibility of me faking this kind of thing. You know, no, can I'm, you I'm see through it? I'm verifying that uh, the black, uh, the black size of, of the, the inside paper is there, but nothing yeah. else is showing through. All right, I, I'm going. It. I'm going to. I'm going to put that one out at the front like that because I get a special feeling about that one. Yeah, sure. If you believe that, then uh, I, I think I've got. Oh, this. This didn't get quite sealed here, so maybe I better not. Mm. All right, let me. First of all, oh, I'm sorry, I'm having a difficult time. I, I have a, a really very bad hip, folks, and I don't want to apologize for it uh, too much, but it is a, a very difficult uh, thing for me to manage up here. Uh -huh. All right, uh, I will. Wait a second. Oh goodness. A hard time here. All right. I'm going to put this one in that position. And uh, now, what I'm going to do is, again, you can't see this. This is very unfortunate. But I'm going to actually, oh, no, kneel down here. Oh, the knees. Oh. Yeah. I'm going to remove each card. Now, th I believe these are in the order one, two, three, four, five. I'll announce that in advance. I'm going to remove each envelope. For those of you sitting in the back, he has made a row on the uh, on the floor, going from your left to right. He is now opening the envelope that, uh, after rearranging everything, uh, he is opening the envelope that was at the far left end. All right, and I'm going to place it right back uh, where it was. Okay, there it is, and that's a used envelope. This one the same way. Oh, this one wasn't licked at all. You, you really should have had the nerve to lick it, you know. Because I, I don't put much poison on them at all. Uh, yes, and we don't need that anymore. And we'll put that right there. And let's see whether this one... So he's removing the cards, but with that blank, uh, heavy paper piece still piece around paper it. still on it, yes. So at yes. the moment, we can't tell... Look at the ceiling mirrors. Oh, heavens. <laughs> you what? Sorry? Uh, someone has just pointed out that there are some mirrors on the ceiling directly above you. Uh, I'm not sure how that would help with the conditions we've got here. It, will, but, it would only work if you, were, future, if you were laying flat on oh, the floor. You can see it. Yeah. Oh, uh, this is the audience using mirrors to yeah. cheat. I understand. Ah. Yes, Good they'd point. have to be laying flat on the floor. No, no. <laughs> they, they're actually able to, to see it from looking over you, Randy, because there's, there's mirrors right above, so some of the folks how, are how very actually getting, yes, getting a well. view. All right. <laughs> yes, so I understand. Yeah. Oh, you know that story too, do you? Okay, now, oh, jeez. 
You want a hand? Keep your seat. No, I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. Ah, it's a dirty laugh. Really, but I appreciate it. Okay. I hope that I'm correct on this. Otherwise, I have to kill myself. But I'll do it by starvation. It's much easier that way, yes. So let me just shake these out of the, the wrappers that I have here. Oh, well. In the first position. Number one is in number one position. Number two There's is in number cross. three position. Number three is in number three position. Bravo. Number four the is square. in position. Bravo. And number five. Yeah. And the star. Folks, I usually do this on a table in front of a bunch of college students. I couldn't possibly do all this uh, wounded hero thing uh, on the knees and everything. But uh, this principle, I think, is a rather subtle principle. Uh, uh, Max and I have, have discussed this because uh, I, I got into details on it, and I wanted him to share this particular uh, illusion with me, this trick, let's put it that way. Well, that's a dirty word, isn't it? Yes. You're, you're actually exposing me to these people that I actually did know what trick you were going to do. <laughs> well, in any case, uh, I have shared this with Max because, frankly, at 83, folks, you start to become aware of your mortality. <laughs> I can tell you that well in advance. Um, because of that, I really wanted to share this. I'm sharing it with Banachek and with Max because I want to, to leave this behind. I want it to go someplace because we have found in magic, I think you'll agree with me uh, on this, Max, uh, I think rather vehemently, that the way to improve our trade of magic, of conjuring, a term I much prefer, is to share it with responsible other performers and put it out into the world. Sometimes you see it come back vastly improved. And uh, it's because they get a chance to work on it and they have a different view of how they should present it or what the gimmick could be uh, done with, what, what we could do to improve it. I think that putting it out into the world like that and letting it be distributed and not publicized with the public, I'm not talking about that, but you folks are not the public. And I want you to know that uh, doing a simple thing like this, I did share it with a couple of magicians in the past, both deceased, so... Don't, don't deceive, please. Okay. Uh, and uh, try to uh, keep I, going. I promise to do my best. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I, I know he's a man of his word, and he will. <laughs> but uh, those magicians added something to this uh, in presentation. And uh, again, they didn't think that I would have to do it on a floor, out of <laughs> sight, <laughs> with no cameras on it and such. But uh, I think you will trust the, uh, the, the witnesses that we have here. And right. I want to thank you five people. Uh, for uh, assisting me in this, and you, sir, and yes, thank you very much. Well, first of all, uh, I will say that I consider myself to be reasonably well-read when it comes to the subject of mentalism, and I can tell you that what Randy has here, although it is, uh, uh, it has a relationship to ideas that have been around since uh, yes. actually the 1700s. And, and Max showed me this last night. He showed me the history of the general principle that is being used here. But the, the particular details that Randy has brought to this are, are new and original with him. And, uh, well, you've seen what the result is. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. You, uh, you touched on something as you were talking about the fact that you had uh, generously uh, decided to share this particular information with, with myself and with uh, Banachek uh, about uh, leaving something behind and, mm -hmm. and, and a legacy. Oh, yes. uh, I think it's uh, woefully premature for us to be talking about the James Randi legacy uh, because given your remarkable vigor, uh, I think 83 is still pretty early in the game for you. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, having said that, it, it's arguably not too early to be talking about uh, certain aspects of the Randy legacy. And so with that in mind, could I get uh, uh, DJ maybe and Thomas to come over and bring over this, uh, this thing we have hiding off to the side? We have a this, thing, ladies and gentlemen. We have a thing. Yeah. You don't, you don't uh, know about this, uh, but we're about How to... How do you know I don't know about it? 
Yes, sir. That's, that's my job. If you had sealed it up in an envelope, I would know. Uh, as we all know, the Magic Castle has uh, very recently undergone a massive facelift uh, by necessity, but as a result, there have been many improvements and changes in the decor. Uh, one thing that has been sorely lacking from the Magic Castle uh, for low these many years is what is hiding behind that black cloth. And uh, Thomas, if, if you would do the honors. Wow. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That is a, uh, that is a, a splendid poster uh, of, of Randy, the amazing Randy, the man no jail can hold. Uh, and it has, uh, uh, it has been beautifully mounted uh, and framed by mm -hmm. the, uh, the JRF folks. And uh, wow. we have spoken to Milt, and uh, there will be a particularly main place for this to be uh, up, and, up and, and on view. Uh, we're going to have it at the very opening of the walkway when you walk from the restaurant to the palace. Oh, yeah. And so you'll, you'll walk past Randy every night you come to the Magic Castle. And that way, uh, even though we're, we're delighted when you are here, even when you're not here, you'll be here. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. But I, I must say something, uh, Max. Uh, this is an original. This is uh, the original printing of the original uh, Man No Jail Can Hold uh, poster. There is a slightly larger one. It's about 25% uh, or so larger, which is a reprint. But this has a secret in it. And I ask you all to investigate it by coming over and looking at it very carefully. Because after I got the artwork, and this is done by a man who signs himself as Jason, uh, J-A-Y-S-O-N, who is now a very famous comic book artist, and his work fetches huge prices. But he was only starting at this time many, many years ago when he made this for me free and gratis. And I've always been grateful to him for that. Uh, the point is that this one has a message which I added to the artwork afterwards. Harry Houdini's name is represented in there. And if you can find it, that's almost enough to win you the million dollars. <laughs> it is a very... 25 cents. 25 cents on it. It is a only. very, very devious uh, it is. way. But Houdini's name is on that poster, and that'll give you just one extra reason to, uh, to come study it, and it uh, when it's on display. And it doesn't only say Houdini. It says Harry Houdini. Okay? All right. So I challenge you to find it. <laughs> Randy, we thank you so much for, for, uh, for this poster. We also thank you for taking the, uh, the time to, to spend this evening with us. And uh, the, the final thing I'll say, the final thing I'll say is uh, I'm going to make you commit right now in front of all these people that we'll do a third one. Yeah, yeah we will. <laughs> James Randy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you all. Very good of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Wow.